This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making from two Canadians. We're hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore, Portfolio Managers at PWL Capital. And welcome to episode 219. And I think it's safe to say, Ben, this will be the shortest intro we've ever done. Which is great. This is the new format. There's nothing. The only note we have is that we just had an incredible long weekend trip to Maine, to the coast of Maine, which is phenomenal with, with my brother and his family and all of us. So perfect weather, perfect weekend. It's so much fun that the ocean was actually swimmable. It was temperature was in the high sixties. Cool. We being you and your family, not me. I was not in Maine. Not, not you. You were not in Maine. Yeah. Anyways, that's all I got for you. That's what's uh, been a lot of fun lately. And yeah. Well, that's great. So I think we can just, we can jump right into our, our main topic and, and, as as our last episode with the two of us with this new format, there's there's lots more discussion and, and chatter at the end, but we'll keep the intro short as intended and uh, start with our with our main topic. But on that, I did hear some comments that people who stuck around actually did enjoy kind of the the, the banter. And frankly, I think you and I both felt the same way, which is there's no pressure to get to the main part. We were able to just kind of. Yeah, but people notice that people yeah. people. One, one of the comments that I saw in the Rational Minder community was that uh, it, it was nice to have the intense part up front, and then the back end is like a cozy wind down conversation. And I, I agree with you; it felt it, it's much more relaxed. It's much more uh, conversational. All right. And, so, so with that, let's keep this short and let's go to the main part of the episode. All right. There we go, the main part of the episode, and then you've got your feature topic right at the top. Yeah, so we're going to talk about the expected returns for alternative asset classes, uh, and alternatives being, uh, there of course, are many alternatives. The ones we're going to talk about are private equity, which is a bit of a repeat because we've given that topic some coverage, venture capital, angel investing, which is a really fun one to talk about, uh, private credit, hedge funds, direct real estate, uh, and cryptocurrencies. That was also a fun one. So this and is a project that- And you're going to fit we, all of this in today. Well, it's not, yeah. I mean, we've we've covered this, larger this awesome. topics. Awesome. Uh, this is a project that we've been working on, uh, of course, in financial planning, which is a big part of what we do for our clients at, at PWL. Uh, for financial planning, you need to have assumptions about the expected returns of asset classes. And while we don't recommend all, all of the alternatives that we're going to talk about, there are cases where people own them. And when that is the case, we can't just ignore them for the purpose of financial planning. Right. So we need to have some some assumptions. And so we tried to get a little bit more scientific about this recently uh, th- than we've been in in the past. It's, it's often easy enough where these are small allocations uh, in someone's situation that we can either ignore them or assign a low expected return and treat them as a, uh, effectively as a speculative asset class where um, if it pays off, great. If it doesn't, it's not going to affect the financial plan. In cases where these assets make up a larger portion of the asset allocation, I think we have to give them more attention, which is why, uh, which is why we started doing this. Now, predicting returns for these alternative asset classes is, is there's an additional layer of difficulty um, or uncertainty relative to public equities, because with public equity, equities, we can make an assumption about the market. And you can be, even though that's we still can't predict the future, uh, you can be pretty sure that whatever the market return is, you're gonna be able to get it with public equities, because you can own an index that captures that, that market beta uh, return, plus whatever factor risk premiums. Uh, with the asset classes we're going to talk about, you can't do that. Like there is no, index fund that captures the aggregate return of private equity or venture capital. Uh, although Ludovic Falpu had a, a like some machine learning methodology to try and replicate PE returns that we talked about briefly. And, and anyway, separate topic. <laughs> that, that's not, I don't think you can buy that as, a, as an index fund anyway. Uh, so the, the, the importance of managers becomes a lot more important in these, uh, or a lot more prevalent in these asset classes. There's no beta, so you're, you're by definition uh, required to select a manager that may or may not give you beta plus some alpha for the asset class. And then the other challenge with a lot of these alternatives is that there's a lot more skewness. Um, 
stock market returns have some skewness. Uh, but alternative asset classes have like a lot of skewness. And we'll talk about the data for uh, venture capital and angel investing. But that makes it even harder because even if we did know what the mean was and could assume that you're going to get the mean, chances are you're not going to get the mean. The fat tails can get you. Yeah. Uh, so that, that anyway, those are just challenges with, yeah. uh, with this. But gi- given all of those challenges, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try and walk through how we approached estimating expected returns. Uh, so we'll start with private equity uh, and specifically buyouts. Uh, we've separated venture capital out. Uh, so th- theoretically, theoretically, you would expect private equity to outperform public equities because private equity investments tend to be smaller companies, lower valuations, at least historically. We'll talk about how that's changed. And illiquidity, which you might expect to get a premium for. Yep. Uh, there's a 2021 paper from Eric Stafford who finds that the returns of private equity can be replicated using public small cap companies with low prices and leverage, which suggests maybe there's not an additional premium for illiquidity. And then Antti Ilmanen has a 2020 paper. Uh, they argue that the lack of a premium in excessive public equities, they, they also find that similar to, to Stafford, uh, suggests that even if an illiquidity premium did exist, they, they theorize in the paper, uh, that it may in practice be largely offset by investor willingness to overpay for the return smoothing effect of illiquid asset classes. And that's, that's something we've talked about on this topic in the, in the past. And it's something that Cliff Asnes hammers all the time. Uh, so that, that, uh, smoothing as a service is what, uh, auntie, uh, called it when he was on our podcast. Now that, that smoothing as a service is something that exists only on paper. You're not actually getting economic smoothing. For example, if you tried to sell your private assets when public assets are down significantly, you would find out that the smoothing on paper is, uh, is not real. It's not real smoothing if you had to value that asset uh, at, at any point in time. Um, I, I think it's pretty reasonable to argue that private assets, private equities in, in the case of what we're talking about now, are probably at least as volatile as public equities. Um, probably more, <laughs> probably more, uh, or, or at least if we use the small caps analogy, like, uh, uh, private equity is probably at least as volatile as small caps, which are t- tend to be more volatile than the market. But of course their valuations are not reported daily. They don't have daily mark to market, uh, accounting like public equities do. So they look smoother. Exactly. Uh, there's a 2018 paper from Welsh and, and Steuben. Uh, they find that after European private equity funds switched to fair value accounting, uh, the reported correlations between private equity uh, and public equity returns increased. And in their sample, after that happened, after the correlations increased, private equity funds access to capital decreased because all of a sudden it looked less attractive as an asset Come class. Come on, really? Because correlations went up. Yeah. So it's like when you take away that illusion of smoothing, the asset class becomes less interesting. So that's, I mean, that's just an an interesting. That is fascinating. It is. I think it's pretty interesting too. Uh, Okay. So historically, start with the historical data. Biots have had an edge over public equities on average. Uh, So there's a a paper from Harris and and some co-authors in 2020, and they find an average public market equivalent of 1.18 for a sample of 893 buyout funds with vintages from 1987 through 2014. It's a huge sample of buyouts. A public market equivalent uh, is, it, it's like a, a PME of 1.18 means you got in aggregate, in, in total over whatever the holding period was, uh, th- there was a, an additional 18% wealth accumulation over the period relative to uh, having owned public equities over the same period with the same cash flows. Right. You can't calculate private equity fund returns in the same way that you calculate uh, public equity returns because there's no mark-to-market accounting and there's lots of weird cash flows with the illiquid, illiquid assets. You combine all that together, it's really tricky. This public market equivalent is a method for attempting to quantify performance differences between public and uh, private investments. And we'll, we'll talk about PME for a couple of other asset classes as well. Um, now, PME is related to or, or based on a public market's benchmark. So the, the 1.18 that I just mentioned for buyouts historically, 
uh, that's based on the S&P 500. Um, now you can also use benchmarks of smaller and lower price companies. Like I mentioned earlier, those are maybe more similar to private equity investments. And PMEs typically do start to move closer to one, which would be parity uh, with, public, with the public market's mm-hmm. benchmark. And we do see that. There's another paper from Harris and, and co-authors in 2014, and they find that against the Russell 2000 value index um, and, and, and some other smaller cap indexes, um, that the PMEs do drop. So in, in their sample, the, the PME against the S&P 500 was 1.2 in this case, in the 2014 paper, uh, against the S&P 500, but only 1.07 against the Russell 2000 value. So as you benchmark against smaller companies, the PMEs do tend to decline. Uh, in Fallopu's 2020 paper, which we discussed with him when he was on the podcast, he finds PMEs and multiples of money, which is another method for trying to quantify performance differences between mm-hmm. private assets and public assets. Uh, he finds for vintages uh, from 2006 to 2015, vintages is like when the fund uh, started. Uh, and then they, they typically have life a lifespan. The, the, the duration of a typical private fund, and this is documented in one of these papers, is, is five years, which is longer than their legal duration. But anyway, um, so that's, uh, the, the, that's what the vintage means. It started at that point, and then they tend to exist for roughly five years on average. So for vintages 2006 to 2015, Fallopu in his 2020 paper finds that the performance of public and private equities is overall very similar. And that's one of the big conclusions of that, uh, of that paper. Now, I, I think another important qualifier for these data is that in the Ilmanin 2020 paper, uh, they find that the valuation gap between private equities and the S&P 500 has declined over the period 1998 through September 2018. And at the end of their sample, the gap is even negative, meaning private valuations at that point in time were higher than public valuations. Now they also document that there's a significant relationship. Well, I don't. I don't know. Uh, significance maybe not the right word. I don't know if it's statistically significant. Visually, it's very obvious, or it seems obvious, that there's a, a, a relationship between private market valuations and forward-looking returns. So you can see, and they have two charts in their paper that show that as the valuation gap narrows, the go-forward difference in returns between public and private equities uh, decreases. So when valuations are the same, for example, you might not expect as much or any premium from private equities. And as of their 2020 paper, valuations were very similar. Uh, Now on a similar line of thinking there, in the Harris 2014 paper, they find that both absolute performance and performance relative to public markets are negatively related to aggregate capital commitments for both buyouts and VC funds. Now that's important because private markets have seen massive inflows in recent years. I think 2021 was was a a record year by many measures for um, new assets being committed to uh, buyouts and venture capital funds. So again, we have valuations increasing, which drives down expected returns. And then there's also a, a separate, although maybe related relationship between uh, capital commitments and go forward returns for buyouts and VC funds, and we've seen recently large capital commitments. So all that to say, relative to history, we may expect lower returns for uh, private equity uh, going forward. Um, AQR has a, well, they follow Illman in 2020's methodology for expected returns. They find um, a real expected return of 5.9% net of 5% fees for buyout funds. And there's a 2008 paper from Fallopu where they estimate private equity fees at 6%. This probably depends heavily on on who you are as an investor and how you're able to access funds. Right. Maybe you're paying closer to 5%. In Canada, uh, it, you, you often have to go through an intermediary to access private equity asset classes or venture capital funds. So I would probably err on the side of 6% or even higher in terms of total cost of ownership for private equity funds. Right. So if we just bump AQR's 5% fee assumption to 6%, um, all of a sudden we, we're, we're at a 4.9% real expected return based on AQR's methodology. 
um, which is only 30 basis points higher than AQR's estimate for U.S. public equities with a multi-factor tilt over the same um, over the same period in their their capital market assumptions paper. So it's it's pretty close, 30 basis points in uh, difference. I also looked at BlackRock. Um, the the two the two main sources I looked at as a kind of a sounding board for for this exercise were AQR and BlackRock. I, I generally trust both of them to think through things thoughtfully. Uh, BlackRock has assumptions for a whole bunch of asset classes that AQR doesn't, but between the two of them, I think that there's a lot of uh, reasonable uh, expectations. And of course, I, like this is all, we're, we're, we're really throwing darts here, <laughs> but we're just trying to be scientific about something that's extremely uncertain. Anyway, uh, so BlackRock suggests an expected nominal return of 14.4% for U.S. buyout funds in, in Canadian dollars, uh, gross of fees with a standard deviation of 26.6%. So if we net out the 6% in fees, the nominal returns 8.4%. Um, for PWL's expected returns uh, in a most recent update, we had 7.09% for global public equities tilted towards smaller and lower priced companies and and profitability with the investment exclusion, but all the, the multi-factor tilt, uh, we had 7.09% for public equities. Uh, so based on the expected return estimates that AQR uh, and BlackRock, BlackRock have, and combining that with the historical PMEs, uh, at least in recent times, close to one, and currently high PE valuations and flows, and the added uncertainty due to the importance of manager selection, uh, which is, again, very important in private equity, uh, we assign for this asset class a, a return 50 basis points higher than public equities, than multi-factor tilted public equities. Um, so not, not a huge premium, mm-hmm. but we did, we, we, we did give it a, we did give it a premium. Um, now I've mentioned that importance of manager selection a couple of times, um, in Harris 2020, they find that top quartile PE funds deliver PMEs of 1.81 which is pretty significant outperformance relative to public equities and bottom quartile funds deliver a PME of 0.68. Uh, so again, if we assume that five year duration that I mentioned earlier, uh, top quartile funds beat public equities by 12.47% per year. Well, bottom quartile funds trail by 7.42% per year. So there's huge dispersion. Um, how do you account for that in financial planning? It's, I mean, there's no, Great answer to the question. What we did is bumped up the uh, standard deviation relative to public equities. Um, in the end, our standard deviation is about the same as what BlackRock assumes. We had about twenty nine percent. But yeah, so, but the point. The go ahead. I was to say the, the. I think point worth mentioning is that I think people expect much higher returns than these handful of basis points. And maybe you get them if you can pick top quartile funds. Well, one of the things I haven't mentioned with with private equity is that there's only evidence of persistence in bottom quartile funds. So bad funds tend to continue being bad, but there is not persistence in top quartile funds. So if you go and pick a previously top quartile manager in buyouts, and this is different than venture capital, but you go and pick a previously uh, top quartile buyout manager, there is not evidence of persistence uh, in, in good returns but you can maybe not invest in the worst buyout managers and you can avoid being bottom quartile, uh, which may, maybe means on average, if we exclude bottom quartile, maybe your expected return is a bit higher, but I still think there's a ton of un, uncertainty in the so asset class. Yeah. And if you try and get more diversified, like if you go to a fund of funds, for example, then all of a sudden you're paying uh, an additional layer of, of fees. So it's, it's, it's tricky. Anyway. Uh, for venture capital, which are, of course, earlier stage investments in company funding, but in, in buyouts, typically uh, the, the the fund is buying a, a company uh, and typically a more mature business. In venture capital, it's earlier stage and not usually buying entire companies. Uh, it's investing in some of the equity of an earlier stage business. Now, in VC, returns do tend to be quite high on average. But the skewness in VC is is massive. Um, I mean, it's it's very significant. So there are VC funds that do exceptionally well, and there is persistence in VC, which is a, that's another interesting characteristic. 
in the top performing VC funds, there is persistence. We asked Bill Janeway about this when he was on and, and he kind of laughed and said that venture capital has an adverse selection problem where if you want to give your money to a VC fund, they're probably not going to take it. I, somebody else gave us that. Uh, uh, oh, it was uh, Gus, Gus Sauter. Mm-hmm. If you want to find the best private market managers, find the ones that won't take your money. <laughs> Um, but if you can get in, like the, in, in some cases, people do have special connections or yep. maybe a VC fund invested in their business and therefore you get access to the, to that fund. Uh, that, so there are cases where you can get access, but I think for the average, uh, person, uh, even for the average high net worth investor, it's not so easy. I mean, I, again, thinking back to the Gus Sauter conversation, I think he said you have to be committing billions of dollars, um, to be confident that you're getting in with the best managers and doing this properly in terms of the required due diligence and stuff like that. Okay. So for the, the Harris 2020 paper, again, they find a sample average PME of 1.22 for a big sample of VC funds with vintages from 1984 through 2014. And another paper from Harris and co-authors in 2014, uh, finds a sample average of 1.2 for vintages 1984 through 2008. Now the median of that sample, so 1.2 mean, public market mm-hmm. equivalent, but the median is 0.88. Um, so that's, that's, that is an indication of skewness or there's a relationship to skewness there where we see such a big difference between the mean and the median. Mm-hmm. Um, but that, that concept of persistence and, uh, adverse selection, I think is really important in interpreting those numbers and deciding which one is relevant to, uh, to use. Um, if you could own the VC market, of course you would use the mean, but if you can't, if you have to pick funds and if you're not sure that you can get access to the best funds, maybe the median makes more sense. But in the case of the median, <laughs> you, you expect to lose money relative to public markets, uh, over the average holding period of a venture capital fund. Uh, so I, I, again, it comes back to that importance of if you can access the best VC funds, great. Uh, if you can't, it becomes a very unattractive asset class very quickly. Um, that, that mean PME of 1.2 over the typical fund duration of five years, uh, which is what uh, I mentioned earlier, Harris, uh, and co-authors find as the average duration of a, of a fund that translates to an annual return difference of 3.7% over public market, uh, cap weighted equities. It's pretty significant. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think it, 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 if you can access the best funds, I would give that 3.7%, a 25% haircut. That's not scientific, um, but just as an expectation, like we talked about the flows into VC, driving down expected return, returns and stuff like that. Yeah. So at the mean, that's 9.87% using the PWL equity expected return as the, as the baseline. Um, but as I mentioned before, if you don't have access to the best funds, I, you just probably wouldn't invest in this asset class. So I don't, I don't think we need a, an expected return assumption for, uh, for that scenario. You just, you just wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't do it. Uh, in terms of quartiles, the top quartile VC funds deliver PMEs of 2.6, bottom quartile 0.41. So again, massive distribution. Um, and again, using that five-year duration, top quartile funds based on those PMEs beat public equities by 21% per year on average, while bottom quartile trailed by 16% wow. per year. Um, yeah, so I mean, that, that's a tricky one, right? Like, and this is why we've, we've uh, uh, not typically assigned expected returns to asset classes like this, because it's like you, you really don't know what you're gonna, what you're gonna get. Uh, but if we were to assign one, that, like I said, it's nine, roughly nine, 9.8%. Uh, unless you can't access the best funds, in which case just avoid the asset class or, or assume an, a, a negative return, I guess, relative to public equities. Uh, for angel investing, this one's really interesting. Uh, so there are a few uh, re- resources and books that I'd read on angel investing. I referred back to those and it turned out that they all referenced the same because I, I remembered reading like uh, return estimates for angel investing. So I went back to my sources for that to see where they got their data from or how they modeled it. And it all comes from this one guy, Wilt, Wilt Bank is the last name of the author. I can't remember his first name. So he's got two papers that are 
sort of big, big studies or the biggest ones that seem to have been done on angel investors. There's a 2007 and a 2009 paper. Uh, they find average angel multiples of around 2.5x with an average holding period of 3.5 years. So that suggests an average annual return of more than 25, 29% hmm. um, on average. Now, again, there's no angel investing index. Um, and it's, it's, even, it's even different from a VC fund, for example, because in a VC fund, you're, you're still getting somewhat of a diversified portfolio of VC investments. With angel investing, like typically, you, you as the p- person who wants to do angel investments has to go out and and do it. Um, now there are there are some uh, angel funds and angel groups and stuff like that, but in a lot of cases you can end up paying fees. With angel groups, actually, you you don't necessarily have to pay uh, fees to participate. Well, there's membership fees, but not fund fees. Anyway, harder to diversify in angel investments. And more than 50% of deals, based on the Wilt Bank research, result in negative returns. Um, and then another important thing, kind of related to what I was just saying, the returns of angel investors are more dependent on the investors themselves than, say, a VC uh, investment. Although I guess with VC, if you can get access, that is maybe somewhat similar. But the, act, the, the actions of angel investors matter a lot more for returns in the Wilt Bank Sample. So I'll explain what that means. Um, angel investors who spend more time on due diligence have higher returns empirically. Um, angel investors with more experience in the industry of the deal have higher returns on average. And angels that mentor and coach the companies they invest in have higher returns on average. Fascinating. Yeah. Now, now w- one of the data points that I pulled out because I, I just thought it was the most interesting one uh, is in, in terms of thinking about expected returns, investors who perform, angel investors who perform less than the median 20 hours of due diligence earn significantly lower returns. So remember that average multiple was 2.5x. Um, the angel investors who perform less than the median 20 hours earn 1.1x over a similar average holding period, uh, which is approximately 2.84% per year, as opposed to the 29% of the, of the mean. Uh, so, I mean, to get that 29%, we're talking about having to do significant due diligence, but also being pretty diversified because, well, oh, there's another data point I have on that actually. So we, uh, in the 2007 Wilt Bank paper, they show that 7% of the exits in their sample uh, achieved returns of more than 10x and account for 75% of the total investment dollar returns in the sample. And that's, that's not actually as extreme as I would maybe have, uh, well, no, that, no, that, that, that is, that is extreme. I was thinking of the, the Bessenbinder wealth creation papers, but this isn't talking about wealth creation. It's talking about returns. So 7% of the exits account for 75% of that mean, uh, return. Right. So not, not so easy to, to capture. Um, it's like uncomfortable trying to assign a, an, an expected return uh, to this asset class. Um, but the, the way that I suggest approaching it, at least for this exercise that we've done here, I gave it a 30% haircut. Again, that's not scientific relative to the historical mean. Now that would be what I would consider a very aggressive assumption for this asset class. And I would only be using that number if it's, uh, if you're extremely well diversified and if you're doing the more than the 20 hours of due diligence per deal, or if somebody, involved with um, managing the portfolio is doing that much due diligence. If not, I would, I would revert back to the, um, the 2.84% per year with a huge number for volatility. Um, John Cochran has a paper on uh, venture capital investments and he, he estimates, I think 107% standard deviation for individual VC investments. So I, I would use something like that for the purpose of wow. estimating expected returns for angel investing. Uh, okay, so that's that's three different private equity asset classes, buyouts, venture capital, angel investing, and they're kind of increasing in their expected returns and their expected, expected volatility and their expected uh, skewness. Uh, private credit is the next one that we looked at. This is one that we've, we've heard a bunch about 
recently it seems to be a very hot asset class which typically means it's going to have low expected returns <laughs> when everyone's talking about it it's not a good time to be in it uh now pri private credit is is varied as I mean, all of these strategies within each of them, you can find um, different uh, different strategies. Uh, in private credit, they can be quite materially different. So there's direct lending, distressed debt, mezzanine debt, and venture debt. They've all got different characteristics. Uh, the data on private credit, uh, there's there's not as much of it, or at least there hasn't been the same level of research done on it. Like in private equity and venture capital, Harris and Kaplan and Fallopu have done tons of work on this. Private credit, not so much. Uh, there's one paper, a 2018 paper, paper from Monday and, uh, and co-authors, and they find that in general, while there may be diversification benefits to private credit strategies based on low correlations with public benchmarks, the PMEs for all of the strategies that they look at, which are the ones that I just mentioned, tend to be close to one. Uh, so you're not necessarily gaining a return edge. Maybe there's a correlation benefit, but I would keep in mind what we talked about earlier, with the illusion of low correlations with private assets. Um, for the PMEs benchmarked against a business development company index uh, and a high yield bond index, all the strategies underperform based on PME. Um, although measured against a leveraged loan index, they all outperform. So these are all public uh, indexes that often have ETFs tracking them. So one of the takeaways is kind of like you, you can kind of recreate these returns with with uh, public assets if you're willing to take a bunch of risk in your fixed income. Uh, now they, in the Monday paper, uh, Monday, M-U-N-D-A-Y, not like the day of the week. <laughs> so that's the 2018 paper. Uh, they make an effort to de-smooth the returns, but because of the, the correlation issue, um, that, that, that's, it's still not perfect. In the Illman and paper for private equity, they do the same thing, but they kind of give the commentary that yeah, this it's it's still not going to be as volatile as you would expect it to be, and if you tried to sell it, back to that comment. Uh, BlackRock for their expected return for private credit, they suggest an eight point eight percent gross of fee expected return for direct lending. So that's one of the strategies that that we talked about, with a standard deviation of ten percent. Uh, similar to private equity, private credit tends to have high fees, so that's an eight point eight percent gross of fee expected return. I didn't find good documentation on total fees that you expect to pay for private uh, credit strategies like I found for private equity. So I don't, I don't actually know what the, what the fees would be. Um, there's a 2022 uh, CFA Institute publication. They suggest an expected return for private cr credit equal to that of public equity, but with a lower volatility. It's interesting. Uh, looking at high yield bonds uh, measured by the Bank of America US High Yield Index. Um, which remember gave a private credit PME of around one for, for most of those strategies uh, when it's used as the benchmark. It underperformed U.S. equities from 1986 through 2022, uh, July 2022, by an annualized 2.63%. Um, but of course, this being a period where uh, bonds performed exceptionally well relative to history. Right. Now, private credit does tend to have shorter duration than high yield indexes, so we might expect lower volatility. Um, but similar to other private asset classes, there's a lot of variability in fund, individual fund returns. Uh, so I, again, these are all shots in the dark, but I, I, I think applying a 2% haircut relative to public equity uh, expected returns and using something similar to what BlackRock had for standard deviation, which was 10%. So that ends up being 5% roughly in terms of expected returns for private credit or with a standard deviation of 10%. Now I grouped those all into one assumption. Uh, I mentioned there are all these different strategies. So if you're investing in any one of them, maybe it makes sense to, to uh, be more specific. Right. Uh, BlackRock's strategic view, so they give strategic commentary and their expected return assumptions, uh, is that publicly traded credit, inc including high yield, has attractive valuations and income potential currently. Uh, and they say that this makes private credit look much less attractive than it has historically. So it's uh, just interesting. Uh, hedge funds. This is another one that's, there's some really interesting data here. Uh, again, hedge funds are extremely varied in their objectives and expected return profiles. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different strategies that you can look at. 
with with totally different objectives. Um, some of them might be actually designed to hedge. Some of them are uh, more return seeking. But anyway, as an asset class, they don't tend to hedge as much as investors might hope. Uh, Cliff Asness has a fairly well known 2001 paper on that topic. Uh, they apply standard techniques to address the illiquid nature of many hedge fund holdings and suggest that hedge funds in aggregate have sig significantly more market exposure than simple estimates might indicate. And that again comes back to the illiquidity of these private assets. Hedge funds also have a big fee problem. This is, this is super interesting. So everyone knows, maybe not everyone. Most people know, especially if you're investing in hedge funds, that you're going to pay 2 and 20, roughly. Yep. Uh, 2% uh, and 20% of any outperformance over a, uh, a hurdle rate. And that's common for most of the asset classes that we've, I, I think all of the asset classes we've talked about so far, typically you're going to pay uh, 2 and 20, at least on some level of, of ownership of these, right. of these assets. Uh, there's a paper from Ben David and co-authors, 2020 paper. They find that the expected incentive fee on diversified portfolio of hedge funds is a lot higher than the contractual fee. And the reasons are super interesting. Uh, so the incentive, empirically, the incentive portion of the fee paid by investors between 1995 and 2016 was nearly 50% compared to the tr uh, average contractual rate in the sample of 19%. So that's of the 2 and 20, that's the 20 so empirically in their sample, it wasn't 20 on average, it was 19 contractually, but uh, act investors actually pay closer to 50% in terms of incentive fees. There are two reasons for that. <laughs> I was going to say why. <laughs> yeah, no, and the reasons are interesting. Uh, so the first reason is that the aggregate profits from a hedge fund portfolio combine the results of winning funds and losing funds but the losses produced by losing funds can't be oh. used to diminish the incentive fees owed to the winning funds. So that's one. Wow. Uh, yeah. And that's the second really, one. Never thought of that. I uh, know. Uh, the, the, the second one is that most hedge funds have a high watermark provision specifying that investors need to recover any prior loss before they pay incentive fees to the fund. Yep. But that pro uh, the protection offered by the high watermark provision is eroded by the behavior of managers and investors, both of whom tend to discontinue investments following losses. There you go. So when a fund is liquidated following losses, investors automatically lose the opportunity to, to earn back their losses without paying additional incentive fees. Right. They leave, missing the chance to get the free ride back up. That's exactly right. And they go invest in a new fund, which if it wins, they, they pay the fund. Isn't that fund. fascinating? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so in their sample, on average, uh, they find that investors pay 1.51% in management fees, and this is all annualized. Um, so instead of two, it's 1.51% on average, um, and then the incentive fee annualized, they find it's 1.93%. Now of the 1.93%, only 0.74 of the fees are justified by excess performance, um, while the remaining 1.19% are paid for, uh, are, have been paid for gains that have not been offset, mm -hmm. uh, or that, that have been offset by losses. Hmm. So there's an extra 1.19% drag, which is that 50% um, performance fee as opposed to the 20% contractual performance fee. Pretty crazy. So it's expensive to own hedge funds, more expensive than the 2 and 20 would, uh, would imply. Uh, and, and then the other thing that, that's actually related to one of the points that we just mentioned is that hedge fund investors tend to be their own worst enemy more so than in public markets. So there's a paper by Dechev and Yu, a 2011 paper. Uh, they find that investors underperform funds by between 3 and 7%, which is a much larger behavior gap uh, than we see in, in public equities, uh, like public mutual funds relative to uh, benchmark indexes. So there's a larger behavior gap. Uh, hedge fund investors tend to display, again, relative to public markets, much stronger performance chasing behavior, which again speaks to that uh, much larger empirical incentive for the reasons that we just went through. Um, the, the, the other challenge for hedge funds is capacity constraints. I talked about this. I, I used a different paper as, as the reference when I did, but I, I did a video a while ago on uh, the endowment model. And I talked about how there's more recent research is finding that uh, historical opportunities that may have existed for alpha and diversification have largely dissipated. So there's a 2021 paper by Bolin and 
co-authors. Uh, they show that the positive contribution of hedge funds as part of a di diversified institutional portfolio has diminished significantly over time, even under the assumption that investors can identify and invest in top performing funds using several predictive characteristics. So maybe if there were historical diversification benefits, those have gone away. Um, BlackRock, for their expected return assumption for hedge funds, they suggest an expected return of 7.8% gross of fees uh, with a standard deviation of 7.7% as hedge funds, broadly speaking. The Credit Suisse Hedge Fund Index, which again contains all different hedge fund categories, returned 7.2% net of all fees with an annualized standard deviation of 6.7% uh, from 1994 through July 2022. Now, to keep it simple, similar to what I mentioned with private credit and the other strategies, we just assign one expected return here uh, for hedge funds as opposed to going through each one individually. Uh, but again, if you were investing in uh, one specific hedge fund strategy, maybe you'd want to, to uh, adjust this based on that. Um, so we, we, we look at BlackRock's figure, um, which is a gross of fees figure, and net out the fees estimated in the Ben David paper that we just went through, and an additional reduction for the additional expected behavior gap that hedge fund investors tend to exhibit, uh, which gives us a net expected return of 3.36% net of fees. So BlackRock was 7.8% gross of fees, um, but for all of those layers of fees and errors, behavioral errors that, that we just saw, um, we, we put that down to 3.36%. I think the big takeaway here too is to highlight the fees and how the fees do erode the returns, obviously. But I, I think many people might be surprised at the magnitude of the fees in these different strategies. Oh, that, that Ben David paper is is mind blowing, mind blowing. Yeah, I, I agree. And same for private equity; like you're paying six percent. And and again, that's another case where um, the, the the sticker price is uh, two and twenty or, or whatever it may be. But when you go through all of the layers of fees and costs for investing in the asset class, which is what Fallopu did in, in that 2008 paper, uh, that's where you get something closer to 6%. And likewise with Ben David, you go through the actual experience of hedge fund investors and as opposed to 2 and 20, you're paying, uh, well, whatever they found, 1.5 and, yeah. and 50. Um, yeah, I, I agree. Fees are, fees are very important. Uh, we did have one for direct real estate. I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I think I'm going to skip that one. It's not the most interesting. I, I think the big takeaway on, on private real estate is, is that it, it performs the same as public real estate. Um, so any, any return expectation for private real estate is, is not going to be materially different from public real estate. El Manon found that in the 2019 paper. Um, I said I wasn't gonna. I was gonna skip it, but I'm not. Uh, we knew you weren't. <laughs> <laughs> so Elman in 2019, they they find that uh, private real estate has delivered returns below or on par with publicly traded real estate investments when you make all the adjustments for sector and, and all that kind of stuff. So that's another more evidence in their view of a lack of an illiquidity premium. And there's a 2018 paper from Peter Mladina. And they find that current and lagged REIT betas and factor benchmark betas explain the entire return premium of private real estate, suggesting that private real estate does not offer a unique source of compensated return that differs from its exposure to systematic risk factors. Now, in, in, in the case of the Mladina paper, he's not just saying that uh, public real estate explains the returns of private real estate. He's saying that the returns of uh, equity and fixed income risk factors explain the returns of both public uh, real estate and private real estate. We've talked about that in the past where it's like, instead of overweighting REITs or private real estate, you could get exposure to the same economic risks by tilting toward uh, small cap value equities and credit uh, fixed income assets. Uh, so I, I think that's, that's important. Uh, as an asset class, real estate has tended to deliver capital returns in line with or slightly above inflation. And there's a bunch of really interesting research on, on that. Uh, I've got three three different sources that look at very long term data and find in, in, in different regions and find the same uh, come to the same conclusion. Uh, in nominal returns, the baseline return for real estate is expected inflation uh, on, on the capital return, and then the rest comes from 
net rental yield. AQR, this is Q3 2021, so this has probably changed because prices have come down, rents have gone up. But as of Q3 2021, AQR had 2.6% as the expected real return for real estate. BlackRock uses 4.1% nominal gross of fees again. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know what, uh, I don't know what exactly makes sense to use, to use here. Uh, I, John Cochran in, in a 2011 paper shows that uh, at least in the U.S., high price to rent ratios signal low future returns for real estate, not rising rents or prices. Um, so I, I my, my my rough guideline here is is BlackRock seems fine at 4.1 percent um, nominal for U.S. real estate. Canadian valuations are still high. Net rental yields are still low relative to the U.S., so maybe take off an additional 1% for hmm. Canadian direct real estate. And this is different, keep in mind, than the figures that we would be using for, well, in, in Canada, maybe it's not different because your net rental yield might be uh, close to zero. I was going to say it's different than what you'd use for the capital return for housing if you're living there. Um, anyway, so net, net rental yield, yields are really what matter for expected returns for real estate and maybe that differs from deal to deal but I, I maybe that's how it makes sense to think about it i would assume the capital return is zero in real terms and the expected return from direct real estate is going to come from whatever the net rental yield is that's probably the best way to think about it for cryptocurrencies now this was a, this was a fun one to try and think through um of course we don't have a lot of data for for cryptocurrencies like what 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 is the equilibrium return of of bitcoin well we have data since uh, like 2010 or something, I think, is when uh, you can actually get uh, get data. Bitcoin traded before that, but no, no one was tracking it, mm-hmm. uh, at least not from uh, price indexes that I've found. Uh, but even say it was 2008, <laughs> great, 14 years of data. I mean, we, we try and use 120 for stocks and bonds when we do our expected return assumptions. And even then, as we've talked about in, in past episodes, that may not be a great estimate of the equilibrium uh, return. So I, I thought maybe we take the, the the demand system asset pricing approach and look at what investors who invest in crypto, uh, w- what else do they invest in? And what can we infer about expected returns for crypto based on how those other asset classes behave? So like if a, if a certain type of investor has a high propensity to invest in a certain type of stock and they also invest in cryptocurrencies, maybe the expected return of cryptocurrencies is similar to that type of stock. Uh, em- empirically, crypto investors tend to be attracted to stocks with lottery-like characteristics, uh, penny stocks, and stocks with high media sentiment. That comes from Tobin Hanspel's uh, paper that we talked about in our crypto series with him. Uh, they also tend to be overconfident and have low financial literacy. And there's three papers uh, that I've got to reference for that. Uh, in investors that share a lot of those traits tend to invest in, in small, high price stocks with low profitability. That comes from Batermier's 2022 paper uh, that we talked with, uh, with him about on, on our podcast a while ago. Uh, looking at cryptocurrencies directly, there's a paper, 2019 paper from Ling and Zhu, uh, they find that network hype plays a significant role in increasing cryptocurrency prices. Uh, Makarov and Shore, we also talked to Igor Makarov in our crypto series, uh, they find that the majority of Bitcoin transactions are related to speculation. And there's another paper from Griff- Griffin and Shams, um, which we talk about in our crypto episode with Chris DeRose uh, that released last last Friday when this comes out. Um, they find that it, at least the 2017 price bubble, which is what they studied, was driven by the unbacked printing of Tether, uh, which is effectively fraudulent activity. Uh, and, and that's what drove the, the price increase at that time. Um, so, of course, assets driven by speculation, hype, and, and fraud, <laughs> uh, we would expect to have low returns. So, as an approximation, we use an index of small stocks with high prices and low profitability, which tend to have lottery-like return distributions to proxy for the expected returns of cryptocurrencies uh, from 1963 through uh, June 2022, the Ken French Small Low Book to Market Low Operating Profitability Index returned 1.07% annualized in nominal terms with a 29% standard deviation. Uh, over the same period, the CRISP, the, the, the U.S. market, 
returned 10.22 to 10.22%. Uh, so meaningful underperformance. Uh, and we know this, like these are the, these are the stocks that Dimensional and Avantis, for example, remove from portfolios because their expected return profiles are so, um, so brutal. Um, so cri crypto, maybe you do get a lottery like payoff, uh, which is great if you win. Um, but from a modeling perspective, I think we have to try and capture the fact that on average lotteries are, are losing games. Uh, it's like the most extreme skewness you can, you can buy, I guess. Uh, so we, we assign a 1% nominal expected return to cryptocurrencies. Um, from 2000, or well, maybe 2015 is when we have data, or did I just choose to use that period? Anyway, from 2015 to 2022, Bitcoin's annualized standard deviation was about 80%. Wow. Um, so on the assumption that the crypto market has maybe matured a little bit, uh, we assign an expected standard deviation of 60%, um, which is roughly double what we observe for the, for the lottery stock index, but also significantly lower than the historical standard deviation of Bitcoin. So basically low expected return, high, high volatility. M maybe some people are into that kind of thing, um, which is, which is okay. Mm -hmm. And maybe you win, maybe you get the lottery, like, That's uh, right. the, the, the lottery, the good lottery outcome. All right. So that, that's it. That's, that's, uh, that's awesome. That's, that's all I got. I, I, I hope it was interesting. I mean, I know a lot of our listeners don't invest in alternative asset classes. And I know there's been a lot of discussion in the Rational Reminder community about managed futures, which we did not talk about. Um, so in terms of alternatives, maybe that would have been interesting, but, but for the research great, that we were... A lot of great takeaways here, right? There's a lot of hype around these different asset classes for a lot of people. So I think there's a bit of a cold shower, at least a, a, an appreciation for the fees. And I think lower expected returns across the board from your research than people would expect. Yeah, uh, probably lower expected mean returns, but I think that's skewness. Like it's the true. Do, do you use the mean or the median um, return when you're making assumptions about these asset classes? In a lot of cases, we did use the mean and then gave it a gave it a haircut. But realistically, maybe the median is better. And if you look at the median return for a lot of the private asset classes, they're 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 brutal. <laughs> I don't I don't know what the median return is on on cryptocurrencies, but um, it's probably not very good either. I mean. Bitcoin and Ethereum, for example, have had fantastic returns, but uh, I don't, I don't, I didn't look for data on what is the, uh, what is the median return on cryptocurrencies since, I don't know, 2015 or something. I don't know, but my, my guess is it's lower than, um, the Bitcoin return series, which even now I, 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 I looked at this a while ago. I wish I had, had done this, gotten this data point, um, for this talk. I, I just didn't think to do it, but um, for, for quite some time now, I can't remember what the actual data point was, but I did look at this a while ago. For quite some time now, uh, investing in the S&P 500 outperforms Bitcoin because Bitcoin has had so many peaks and troughs. Um, if you invested at one of the one of the peaks and maybe it was 2017 or something like that, um, at this point, you've significantly underperformed investing in US stocks. Uh, it's just a, an interesting point. All right, so you want to talk about or do a follow-up on the financial literacy. Yeah, so uh, D Jason Pereira, who's, who's one of our friends in the industry, he sent me uh, a study that the Ontario Securities Commission did. Uh, it was an investor knowledge study. And I, I think it came out after we recorded our episode on financial literacy. If it had come out before, if I'd seen it before, I would have included these data points in that discussion. But I thought it was a worthwhile uh, follow-up. Uh, so they tested 27 financial literacy questions, and this is in for, for Canadians. Uh, they tested 27 financial literacy questions covering a whole bunch of investment-related topics. Uh, on average, investors answered 53% of the questions correctly. Hmm. Canadians uh, answering the, the study that we talked about in our last financial literacy uh, episode, the, the S&P Glo Global Finlit survey, uh, th those questions, Canadians got 68% right in that. Finlet study. And for the exact same questions in this study from the OSC, they also got 68% correct. So that was interesting uh, hmm. uh, on average that the two studies just lined up for, for those questions being tested. Um, in this OSC study, investors had the least knowledge when it comes to investment costs and investor protections. Uh, the fewest correct responses provided were to questions about uh, 
the investment cost was 36% correct and portfolio protections was 44% uh, correct. Uh, about three in 10 Canadian investors self-assessed their financial, uh, uh, their financial knowledge too highly. Uh, so comparing the prior self-assessments to investors' actual results, um, about 30% underperformed their expectations uh, and 14% uh, exceeded their own expectations. Uh, the most financially literate in the sample were self-directed investors, which is perhaps not surprising. Uh, they answered 59% of the questions correctly on average. Uh, for investors with advisors, they got 52% correct and the least financially literate, which is actually really interesting. Were, were the I- investors using a robo-advisor? And I say that's really interesting because if, if I mean, it's 49%, they got 49% of the questions correct versus 59%. Now, that's, that's a meaningful difference for self-directed investors. That's interesting because with the robo-advisor, you're getting pretty bare bones advice and you're getting um, cookie cutter asset allocation advice, which I believe tends to err on the side of being conservative because the robo-advisors don't want to get in regulatory trouble for putting people in you know, 100% equity or like a small cap value portfolio. But it is interesting to see that those investors are the least financially literate and therefore maybe the least likely to ad- advocate for um, for their asset allocation decisions. Uh, women, and this is similar to other studies we talked about last time we covered this topic, women were slight, uh, slightly less financially literate than men. They got 50% of questions correct on average compared to 56% for men. Uh, th- this study found that there are effective ways to de-bias investors in terms of overconfidence. Uh, 31% of participants lowered their self-assessment of their financial knowledge after going through the 27 questions in the, in the study. Yeah. Uh, y- younger investors were more likely to revise down their self-assessment of their financial literacy after going through the questions. So that, that, that's it. I just, it was interesting follow-up. This, this had more investment-related questions as opposed to general financial literacy questions. That point about costs, I think, being the worst uh, testing area for Canadians, I mean, maybe it's not surprising. Like we know Canada's got some of the, uh, is on the higher end of uh, mutual fund fees and, and the higher end of, continuing to have assets in actively managed mutual funds. So maybe that speaks to part of the reason why. Interesting data points. So I think we'll skip the book review this week, Ben, and push it forward a couple of weeks just to keep your expect returns part in one bundle. And we had a a good guest coming up. So, but I thought it'd be worthwhile to talk about a conference I was at uh, last week now. So it's called the Future Proof Conference, which, um, basically blows up the old model of going to financial advisor conferences that always happen in some hotel boardroom. I mean, I've gone to them for decades. You've gone to a few. And, you know, they're, they're so typical. you got the vendors outside, you got the coffee stations, and you're all sitting in a big room with, you know, chairs staring at the front. And, yeah, you get good speakers, but the overall experience is usually quite boring, right? So... Um, and hats off to the guys at Ritholtz Wealth Management in New York City and the organizer of the event, Advisor Circle. They came up with an idea of what to do in a COVID world where you can bring people together. So they came up with this future-proof idea, which was billed as the first ever wealth festival. And it was in Huntington Beach, California, which is you know dubbed as Surf City, USA. It's about an hour south of LA. And it was... Uh, a big risk because it could have been like the, you know, the fire festival for those who've seen the fire festival documentary, <laughs> it could have been a complete, uh, disaster. You know, had it rained or maybe it just didn't work. Maybe people didn't come uh, and maybe the format didn't work, but I can tell you, um, it was, it created an environment that was phenomenal. So it was completely outside and it was in a, a, a lot that was wedged between the Pacific coast highway and the beach, literally the beach was right there. So it makes this, Phenomenal backdrop. It was four days of perfect weather. They had four stages set up. All the vendors were intermixed. They had food trucks on the outside, so that the physicality of it was really interesting. And was it was it was cool, right? You're outside, so it was safe. Um, people were having fun, but the people that were there really treated the content seriously. Like people wanted to learn. You know, you just sit down at a, at a picnic table and talk to people and people were just kind of asking all kinds of questions. The level of engagement, my experience, was that it was really high. So even though people were going around in shorts and, 
and flip flops and skateboarding and, 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 and like it was fun. It was, they treated the material seriously. I, I honestly, I got chatting to so many people. I, I, I miss a lot of the presentations, the ones I went to, some were really, really good. Um, and I don't remember coming away from a conference, which uh, with as many action items as I did at this event, because so many people had so many ideas and, and maybe it was a type of people that were attracted to this. They were just kind of idea machines. So it was, it was, um, it was pretty incredible. They've already scheduled one for next year. Um, well, wait, 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 don't just tell me you got action items. What were they? Oh, all kinds of action items. I mean, I mean, I have a whole list of my Evernote. Um, things to do about structuring the company, um, ideas about guests on the podcast. Um, you know, as you know, I had got a chance to sit with uh, past guest Hal Hurstfield. So he had different ideas about, you know, who to reach out to and how he might be able to help us, you know, meet people. I uh, got some great feedback from a lot of people on the podcast, which was which was really cool to hear how, how people are using the content particularly the, the, you know, the research that, that you have done. Got a lot of ideas around that. Um, got to spend a, a fair amount of time with, you know, a good friend of ours who I'd never met face to face before, Brian Portnoy. So he's a two time guest. So he was there and he presented a really great presentation that he did. And I met his newest team member, Jordan Hutchison, who get this, just completed his PhD dissertation about advisors working in flow. What does that mean? I know what flow is, but what does advisors and flow mean? Advisors, just the benefit of advisors getting into their flow state as part of their job. So I want to follow up with them and learn more about it. I didn't get a chance to spend a lot of time talking about it, but that was his PhD dissertation. How interesting it is, can that be, right? Um, so uh, if anyone's looking to learn and have fun and get to Southern California, I would highly recommend looking at this for next year. So kudos to, to Barry and Josh and the guys at Red Holtz and uh look forward to next year's event and i think next year we'll have more people from our team going like it's technology ideas there was a lot of crypto i think it could have been perhaps there, there was a lot of crypto a lot of crypto presentations which it would have been nice of um some of the counter arguments presented just to challenge some of the the what the presentations i went to it was oh that's interesting well, well quite hold optimistic. on so you you may know more about crypto than a lot of people because we've just we're nearing the completion of this crypto series. Uh, what g- given what you know from the work we've done, what was your take on what you heard about crypto there? It would have been so great to have people that challenge some of the statements. Like someone was asked, you know, what is crypto, and it was presented as um, a huge marketing opportunity for investment advisors. Oh wow. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. With, you can only lose all your money, but you can make a hundred X. Oh now, yeah. They, they weren't, they weren't, they were not proposing a huge weighting, but why not go one, two, three, four percent of your portfolio? You got limited downside, but you got huge upside. On the basis of it being a marketing opportunity, because you don't have much to lose, but if you win, you're going to be the smartest advisor in the country. Correct. And, and you are doing huh. a fiduciary disservice because people are doing it anyways. And if you can do it better for the people that are doing it anyways, that is your fiduciary obligation to clients. Wow. So I guess we'll a, agree to disagree on that. That's an interesting take, but it would have been nice. I mean, that, I, I'm not saying they're not entitled to that opinion, but it would have been nice to have more counterbalance, counter debate on that. And there may have been, it could have been on another stage. I did, I didn't, you can't because there's four stages going all the time for four days. So there's, I think they had 200, 200 plus presenters. So there's a lot of content there. Wow. Interesting. I, I, I probably won't go. I, I like learning, but I don't like having fun. So no, it's, it's not. Sound. It's not your. It is not your kind of event. Trust me on that. It is not your kind of event. Um. um uh, just speaking of crypto, uh, we we recorded yesterday an episode with Ari Jules, who is a proponent of crypto and blockchain. He's at Cornell Tech. Uh, he runs their IC three research group, which is their crypto and blockchain research group. I don't know what you thought of that conversation, but I thought it was, it, he's very thoughtful and very articulate and well-spoken. And uh, yeah, we, we asked him a little bit about what he thinks about the the crypto critics who have similar uh, academic training and technical expertise to, to what he has. And his view is basically that they have a lot of valid points, but they've gone 
too far with it. And honestly, that's I, I've been getting that feeling too. Like some of the earlier episodes we did on crypto, um, and then as we've progressed through and gotten more viewpoints and and uh, and learned more about it, I think that the full on all of crypto and blockchain is a is a complete scam. I I, I do think that that's uh, I, I don't think that's the right perspective. And well, if if people are listening to this who also listened to our episode with Chris DeRose last week, I think he made a similar comment where it's like. Um, if you think that all of this is dumb, you're probably very wrong. Um, but likewise, if you think it's going to revolutionize the whole world, you're probably also very wrong. Um, I, I, yeah, I, 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 I've, I'm still highly skeptical of the space because I do think it's full of scams and, uh, bad investments that are being pitched as good, good investments. Um, but I think I've softened a bit on on the whole space being an a, 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 a objective scam. I don't know. What, I don't know if you've changed your view at all after talking to Ari. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think that's a good way of putting it, right? Is it is it as bad as some people purport? Maybe, but it does seem a little extreme. Is it going to be changing the world as we know it? I think that might be over optimistic. But I, 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 I every, it's funny. Every interview we do, it kind of pulls us one way or the other, right? Yeah, maybe it's recency bias. I don't know. So maybe but there's a mean uh, distribution of where it's going to go. Ari made the point that, and I, I, I said to Ari during that episode, like I, I don't know why I hadn't thought about that before, but all, all technological innovations have come with scams, a lot of scams. I remember reading, um, I think it's a random walk down Wall Street, I think. Uh, but they go through the history, and I, I talk about this in my video on... Uh, on thematic ETFs, I think is the one I, I use all those examples, but there's like, you go through the decades and there's the, the Tronics boom, the dot com boom, r- railroads. You go through all of those cases and there, there were a ton of scams, fraud, like outright fraud. And that was Ari's point. Like, yes, we're seeing a lot of fraud in crypto. And yes, crypto is very well suited for fraudulent activity. But you go through other instances. Maybe it's more prevalent in crypto. I don't know. I don't have the empirical data to to make that judgment. But I, I think it's a valid point that you go through all of the other instances of things that did end up being revolutionary. And I'm not saying crypto is revolutionary, but you go through other instances of things that could have been regu- uh, revolutionary and ex post in a lot of cases were, and they were full of scams, full, hmm. and and asset price bubbles. So I think that is a criticism of crypto. It's valid and it's true. And again, crypto is particularly well suited to be used for scamming people. But I don't know if that's a, a valid reason to say that it's all and and, and forever completely useless um, technology. It's a good way of summarizing it. Um, so let's set up our 22 and 22 challenge reading guest. And I think we'll defer letters and notes and feedback to next time. How's that? Do you, do you want to do the reviews quick? And, and then, uh, but yeah, we, we, we got two very nice long form, uh, one email and one letter that, that I think we should discuss, but we, I, I want to give them more yeah. thought before because exactly. they're, they're very, very, very warm, thoughtful letters just about the impact that the podcast has had on, uh, on a couple of people. But yeah, we'll defer that. But do you want to do reviews quick and then... Uh, sure, go and do reviews. Go ahead. Uh, so o- OK Derek from the US uh, said that we're one of the one of his few podcast descriptions. Great podcast with excellent hosts. Did we decide to stop reading reviews and we're doing it again? I don't remember. <laughs> it's all an experiment. <laughs> okay, whatever. Uh, uh, and then Swedish lawyer from, you guessed it, Sweden. Uh, that they're drawn to the podcast mainly for a thoughtful dissemination of investment research. They've learned a lot over the past years. Uh, they were not initially excited with the crypto specials, but it's been great to get different perspectives uh, and the discussions on what money uh, is, what money really is, has been interesting. And we're the most well prepared hosts in podcasting. We 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 do try to be. We 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 had a, a group of advisors from uh, different parts of the world in our office yesterday as part of a, a, a learning, uh, I don't know, what, what do you call that? What's it called? Uh, uh, due diligence tour. Due diligence tour. Yeah. So this is a thing that PWL engages in with other firms to just 
learn about what other people are yeah. doing in terms of best practices. And they wanted to know about the podcast. Um, but, and I think that was one of our big messages to them is that like we, we put many, many hours into preparing for our conversations both between each other and with our, with our guests. I, I don't think you can, it's not, it's not, a, it's not, well, David Senra, who we're about to talk to, he talks about this. It's not, it's not a job. It's a, the life of a crazy person. <laughs> yeah. And then so many people in the business, it's been my experience. You're looking for that, you know, what's the silver bullet solution? Like, what yeah. can I say? What can I do in SEO that'll drive business? We do not do this deliberately to drive business. We try to do the best we can each week to put out content that we find fun and preparing and presenting. That's what we're doing. And I, I think a lot of people are, are, are perhaps learning that. Like you, you, you have to put the time in. And if you don't love doing it, you're not going to put the time in. Yeah. But it's the kind of thing where if, if I think if this were a, a job in the, in the sense of like you go to work to get, to get paid, we would, would be considered unhealthy individuals <laughs> and, ha and having horrible work-life balance and stuff like that. But that's not how, yeah. that's not how it feels. No. But if you were to try and find somebody and say, I'm going to pay you this, this amount of money to do exactly what I'm doing now, first of all, the, the hourly rate of pay would be horrendous because, <laughs> because it's like a, it's like a, 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 I don't even know, 12 hour a day, every day of the week job in quotation marks, but it's not a job, uh, in, in the sense, because I think we both love doing this stuff and reading about it and learning about it and listening to other podcasts. So anyway. you mentioned you mentioned reading in podcasts. That's a perfect segue to the setup for our twenty two and twenty two guest. So I was listening to Patrick O'Shaughnessy's Invest Like the Best podcast. I think it's two or three weeks ago, and he had David Senra on as a guest. So David uh, has a passion for studying company founders and for reading, and uh, he has a podcast called the Founders Podcast. So I almost skipped listening to it. I'm like, ah. I, was, I listened to it. So I now listen to podcasts when I ride the Peloton. So I listened to it, and man, he came full game, full energy. I was kind of blown away by the, by the, the, the conversation they had. He has an unreal reading habit. He reads half of every day. So his, his job is basically read half the day and then spend the other half of the day preparing for the podcast. And as Patrick suggested, he suspects there's probably no other human who has ever read more books biographies, autobiographies about founders as much as David has. And uh, if you look in the feed, you know, he, he reads, you know, biographies or backgrounds of Steve Jobs, Bob Dylan, uh, Rockefeller, Jay-Z, the list goes on and on, like 300 people he's covered. Uh, one book he highly recommended, which I've read since then, is a book about Edwin Land, who, who was the founder of Polaroid, which is an unbelievable technology story that goes back to like 1937, discovered the instant camera in 1948, then it became this, I think we all know this pop phenomenon in the 70s and 80s, and then went bankrupt in, in the 2000s. It's an amazing story. Um, so anyways, the, the interview with Patrick was was super enjoyable, super energy. So I reached out to David and he agreed to to join us. So here's our conversation with, uh, with David Sendra and thanks everybody for listening this week. David Senra, thanks for joining us on the Rational Minder podcast and helping to inspire people as part of our 22 and 22 reading challenge. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So I, I heard you, you know, as I said at the top of the show, um, on the podcast with Patrick O'Shaughnessy, and I was blown away by your energy that you brought to not just reading, but learning what you read and bringing those lessons to your, your, your podcast audience. So I was incredibly impressed. So tell, tell us, where did your passion for reading about founders come from? So I think the passion came from reading in general first, since it's like, that's the only habit I've had my entire life that I, that has like unbroken from the time I could read till now. Like I read everything all the time. I'll like walk into a room, I'll read the entire menu. I have no idea where it came from. Um, and then just being interested in entrepreneurship, I didn't even think of like, now there's like this entire like entrepreneurship industry, but Back then, it was just like, how can I make more money? I need to make money. I was working full time in high school. And um, I was like, okay, like the first opportunity I had where it's like, at, I uh, was working at a car wash. I worked at a car wash for three years and three days, actually. <laughs> and um, I actually got fired from that job. But uh, the first like interest in entrepreneurship was like, wait, I'm making, you know, what I thought was good money for a high schooler. 
And then I had clients and customers would, you'd have repeat customers and they'd come in and like, Hey, will you do what you're doing for me? Uh, like just come to my house and do it. And instead of getting, you know, 10% or 20% of what I pay here, like you get a hundred percent. And so that was like my first introduction into entrepreneurship. I was like, wait a minute, like there's no cap to what you can make. Like if you can actually find a way to capture all the value or a larger percentage of the value that you create in the world, like you essentially have unlimited amount of money that you could make. Um, and then, so I went to, I, I, when I was in college, I was in a business school and I was reading, I started reading biographies of, at that time it was like really popular. So I read like biographies of like Jack Welch and like Jamie Dimon. And I just was way more interested in the, personalities in the eccentric personalities of the people that start the companies. And so I was actually listening to a podcast a long time ago. This is like back in 2012, where I got the first got the idea to focus on entrepreneurs is because there's this guy named Kevin Rose. He was the founder of this company, Dig. And he was like one of the big Web2 founders. He made like, he was like probably 20 years old. They put him on the cover of a magazine and they're like, who the hell gave this guy? I think he raised like $50 million. You know, this is probably 2002, 2003, somewhere in there. And so he had one of the f very first video, high quality video podcasts that interviewed entrepreneurs, right? And it's called Foundation. It's still available on YouTube to this day. And he interviewed Elon Musk in 2012. And they're in the factory of Tesla. And I think Tesla at the time had just released the Model S. So it's like not at all clear. You know, they'd sold like 2,500 uh, of the Roadster. Now he took that money threw it into the, the Model S, but it wasn't at all clear what the future trajectory of Tesla was. And Kevin was just perplexed. He's like, you came over from Canada, uh, from South Africa to Canada, then you emigrated to California, and then you show up, you don't know anybody, you start your first company when you're in your 20s. A, a lot of people know, obviously, or don't know, obviously, that um, Elon Musk sold his first company, Zip2, when he was like 27. And he sold it for like $300 million. And he winds up netting, you know, 25 or $30 million, and Kevin's like, how did you figure out how to do this? Like, did you have mentors? Did you read a lot of books? Did you have connections? And Elon said something that I thought was interesting. He's like, no, I didn't have any mentors. He's like, I used books. Uh, I like to read books because I found mentors in historical context. And Kevin's follow-up question is what gave me the seed idea to do Founders podcast later on. And he's like, oh, did you read like a lot of business books? And Elon's like, no, I didn't read business books. I read biographies and autobiographies. I thought they were helpful. And then he goes into like, admiring Benjamin Franklin and describing what he learned from his life and like how you could apply to that. And then in subsequent interviews, Elon would talk about reading biographies of Elon, uh, of Henry Ford, uh, every single person's ever designed a rocket. And he just talks about uh, all the ideas that he learned from them building the business and what he applied to his. And I was like, man, that's a really good idea. I should start reading more biographies of founders. Hmm. That's really cool. Now, now readings become part of your your career. Uh, can you tell us about your reading habit? Yeah. So this is a funny thing. Um, there's a fantastic founder. He's a former founder, this guy named Derek Sivers. And he founded this company named CD Baby. Most people know him now because he's a writer and he's, uh, he's appeared on a bunch of podcasts that went viral. Like his episode with Tim Ferriss was fantastic. Um, and I've read his entire blog because I, I think he's a very unique thinker. It's like who sells this company, then puts it in a trust for charity and then lives off the interest of that every year. And then now just make just writes like he's just a very unique person. And so he said something that I think resonates because a lot of people are like, how, how do you read so much? And they, they expect like some complicated process. And he, and Derek says, like, if you just love to do something, it's very simple to you. So he compared it to running. He's like, if you talk to somebody that loves to run and may run every day, people that to people that don't do that, they ask, like, how do you do it? And the person responds, it's like, well, I wake up, I put on my running shoes and I go out the door. And so people ask me that question a lot where it's like, how do you read so much? And they expect like, do you speed read? Do you do this? It's just like, I pick up a book and I stare at it. Like, that's all I do. I just love to do it. So I wake up, I usually work out um, for, do some kind of physical activity for an hour. And then I try to read three to four hours in the morning because I feel my brain works better. This actually, Jeff Bezos said the same thing uh, where it's just like, your brain tends to work better after you're well rested in the morning. And so if I need to really focus and really absorb what I'm reading, I do that in, uh, you know, for three to four hours, as much as my brain can take. And I take a break. And then in the, the second part of my workday is just reviewing all the past highlights that I've, I've read. And those are easy because instead of reading, you know, chapter after chapter, maybe, and I actually read slow. So like yesterday, it took me uh, four hours to get through 100 pages um, because I'm stopping 
like I'm reading uh, Cable Cowboy by this this guy named John Malone, who's it's the most recommended book on founders that I have not read yet. People will not mm. leave me alone. They're like, you have to read the book, have to read the book. But it's really complicated to see how he built that cable uh, company. And so I'm reading the book, but then I stop. I'm like, oh, that's something that's like I remember Warren Buffett said in his shareholder letters. So I'd have to deviate for like 20 minutes. So I find you know, go through all the highlights of the Warren Buffett shareholders and then find it and then tie it into that book. And what I'll do is I'll take the past highlight from like Warren Buffett shareholder. I'll write it out by hand and I'll put it in the page of that book. Hmm. Um, and so that just like reinforces what I do. So the the afternoon reading when I'm reviewing my highlights in this app called Readwise, those are like tweet size, maybe like a paragraph, maybe a couple sentences. And they're all different books because the, the app uh, the app presents my past highlights to me in random order. And that's easier. Like that's my brain is not as good in the like my mind is not as good in the afternoon, but it's a lot easier because it's like a little chunk. And then I just sit there and think I was like, OK, what like what can I tie that to? What does that remind me of? And then if there's any notes or anything else, like I'll, I'll like make them for the episode that I'm working on that week. You mentioned a book that people were bugging you to read more generally. Where do you get your ideas for which founders you want to learn about? So I heard this um there's a, a woman named Maria Pop. I don't know how to pronounce her name. Pop Popov, maybe something like that. She runs the website. It used to be called Brain Pickings. It's called something else now. And she's like this one, this like obsessed reader too, where her essentially like my podcast is like my, my version of what she does on her blog, where she essentially catalogs all the stuff she reads and like puts her, adds her thoughts to that. Right. And I heard on a podcast one time that said, she said something that was fantastic. She said that books are the original links and that, just like the internet today will take you from one idea to another, right? They were like a hyperlink. Books served that purpose before the invention of the inter internet. Mm. And you could do that because like you're reading about somebody and then they'll talk. There's two cases of this. It's like they talk about people that are important to them, right? And then you can also go to the bibliography. Like I just reread the most famous um, biography of Rockefeller is Titan. A ton of people read it. It's been out for 20 years. And I read it, reread it the second time and did another episode on it recently. But then I went to the bibliography. I'm like, oh, I need to find other books. And I found source material that that author used. And I found a little known, like 40 year old, 250 page biography of Rockefeller. That was fantastic. Oh. And so then I did an episode on that. But um, so uh, I'm going to start with the example, like Steve Jobs. Like I read well, uh, Steve, the Steve Jobs book, Walter Isaac's hidden like four or five years ago in that book. Steve tells about like, cause what I notice about anybody that gets to the top of their profession, they all have deep historical knowledge and they're very interested about the people that came before them. So Steve will talk about all the people that influenced his work. The founders of HP, Intel, uh, Edwin Land, Da Vinci, Michelangelo, Henry Ford, just, uh, Gandhi, he just goes down the list. And so then what I would do is like, I make a list of all the people they talk about. Then I read every single book I could find about them. And I'll do that over and over and over again. And then because of the audience, like the audience, people in my audience, listeners send me books every day. Like uh, my queue right now, and I've lost count. I, I can't even, like last I counted, it was like 300 books in the queue that I have mm -hmm. to get to. Wow. I just started managing a queue because we're getting recommendations now. I think I'm up to probably 30 or 40 books that people are recommending. So I want to go back to your habit of capturing the information. So I also use Readwise. but So I capture Readwise from my Kindle digitally. How do you integrate your notes you're taking by hand, I assume, from hard copy books into Readwise? Like, What is that, what is that hack that you use? There is no hack. I do it the hard way. Just so type it in. So yeah, so I like I wish I could retain information. Like the the sometimes I have to do an episode off of a Kindle, like if I'm traveling or whatever the case is. Uh like I'll read the entire book on my phone. I actually got that idea from Elon too. Um it's actually pretty easy, it's really fast. But for some reason it's like I have like a love affair with physical books. And so even though it's much slower, <laughs> I do it anyways. And so Basically, like I'll start with, usually with a physical book. And I'll, I read a lot of old books that don't even have Audible or, or Kindle versions. So what I'll do is like uh, I, I'll pick up a physical book. I sit down with a ruler, a uh, pen and scissors and uh, post-it notes. And then I'll highlight like I used to use a highlighter, but then I'd go back and reread my highlights. And you can't even tell what's highlighted because it like fades over time. So that's why I had to start using the pen. So then once I go through the entire book, I just whatever jumps out at me, I don't think at all. I just like, oh, that's interesting. Underline it. And then I'll leave whatever note pops to mind, right? Then uh, I finish the book 
And then what I'll do is the night before I record, I like to reread all my highlights. And so I'll re I'll sit down. It usually takes maybe like an hour, whatever the case is. And I'll reread all the highlights, right? And all the notes. And then I record the next morning. And as I'm recording, I kind of edit based on the flow of the conversation. Because the way my podcast is set up is like, I wanted it to be like, hey, what if you had, you met up with your friend that reads a lot and you met up with like dinner uh, every once a week and he told you the stuff that was interesting. And in, during the conversation, the flow of the conversation, I don't know what I'm going to say. And so I'm mm-hmm. editing on the fly where it's like, I'll go to another page. Like, oh, you know what? That does like, I'm not going to include that part because that maybe I already covered it or, uh, or it just doesn't fit in the flow of the conversation or whatever the case it is. So then I finish that, right? Then I listen back to the to the podcast before I publish it. So that's the fourth time I've gone over the highlights. And then the fifth time is I go through on the Readwise app, on the iOS app, they have where you could take pictures. It automatically reads the text. You got to fix some of it, but it's really actually good. And then you go through and literally take pictures of every highlight, then type in whatever note I have on the post note, I put into Readwise as well. So mm. I think... And the reason I don't believe in hacks or shortcuts is because the longer the podcast goes on, I don't just talk about, oh, like I just did a podcast yesterday on Thomas Edison. You know, I talked to probably about half a dozen or maybe a dozen other founders that thought like Thomas Edison or something in that book related to past like episodes and past highlights. And the reason I'm able to recall a lot of that stuff is because I'm first of all reading every highlight five times and then I'll wind up rereading that highlight in the future. So to me, that's the equivalent of like uh, practice of like an athlete like lifting weights or running sprints or shooting free throws. And so that's what I consider. It's like my more, the first part of my day is work. The second part of my day is practice, but I do that seven days a week. Hmm. Are are there founder stories that have been particularly impactful uh, for you? hundred percent. So what's fascinating to me is I, every single person like to get on founders podcast, think about how crazy it is. Like they have to be, so good at what they did for a living that somebody wrote a book about them. (laughs) Like That's like the smallest percentage of anybody that's ever lived. But what I find is most of them make, these are imperfect human beings just like everybody else, right? And most of them make the mistake of over-optimizing their professional life to the detriment of their health, their happiness, their family life, just overall, like they're completely obsessed. And so out of, you know, I went to 200, I think yesterday's 270 something, maybe 277 biographies I've read. The only one that I found that like, the one person that I want to try to be the most like is this guy named Ed Thorpe. And this book is called A Man yeah. for All Markets. Ed Thorpe is still alive. He just did a fantastic interview. Tim Ferriss on Tim Ferriss' podcast. Ed Thorpe is 90 years old. And you can watch this interview on YouTube. And I've sent it to friends. I asked my wife. I'm like, how old do you think this guy is? And they're like, 65? Like, it's remarkable. And what Ed Thorpe identified is like, what makes a truly happy human being? And Ed Thorpe's also a genius, so he's way smarter than me. I'm not trying to compare myself to him. He is, I could read for the rest of my life and I'll never be as smart as that guy. But what he identifies is like, okay, I want to be wealthy, right? He's the inventor of the first quantitative hedge fund. Um, he's like, I want to take care of my health. So he worked out. He says, every hour uh, that I spend working out, I look at one day less that I'll spend in the hospital later to my life. He was a great father. Uh, he actually knew his kids, which a lot of the entrepreneurs that I studied, including Edison, Like his kids are in that book. They're like, you know, we never saw our dad. We don't really, we didn't really Mm -hmm. know him. Uh, We, they knew him later because they start working in his company, but kids, like he just wasn't around. He's working, you know, essentially when, if his eyes are open, he was working. Um, And then he had fun and he lived a life of adventure, adventure. Like there's crazy stories in a man of all markets. Like he has dinner with a 38 year old Warren Buffett and he leaves the dinner and he tells his wife, I'm pretty sure that guy's going to be the richest person in the world one day. <laughs> he's just like, it was immediately he's like, this guy is a genius. Like if he keeps at it, he keeps compounding. He's going to be the richest person. Uh, he winds up building the first, uh, Claude Shannon's the founder of information theory. I also read his biography, but he Ed Thorpe and Claude Shannon build the world's first wearable computer. Cause they're trying to figure out, can you use computing to predict, uh, where like to get an edge in, in casino gambling games, whether it's mm-hmm. be blackjack or, or what's the one where they roll the, the, it spins around like the, the um, uh, craps. Roulette. 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 That's what, yeah, roulette. And so he just, he completely, he, he identified like a handful, maybe five things that are important to human beings that when you get to the end of your life, you're like, I'm glad I didn't miss my kid's childhood. I'm glad I, his wife winds up dying of cancer, unfortunately. But after he dies, like, you know, we, we had a great marriage. Like we spent a lot of time together. Uh, he'd work. He found a way to, to use leverage in his business. And I don't mean financial leverage. 
um, where he'd work, you know, I mean, he had an auto, essentially like an automated hedge fund towards the, the second hedge fund he did. And, you know, he worked 40 hours, maybe 50 hours a week, but he wasn't working a hundred hours. And so that's the thing. Like I work every day, but even if I only work eight hours a day, that's only 56 hours a week. You, I still have plenty of time. Like it's yeah. like you eight sleep for eight hours, work for eight hours and you got eight hours to do whatever else you want. I agree. That was a great interview with Tim. Uh, so one, one of the things you said to Patrick, I found interesting is that you will often reread books and that there is tremendous power in doing that. Do you read that book differently the second time? Yes. Cause the words on the page don't change, but you do as a person, like we're the reason, like we're, I mean, essentially the conversation you were, we're having right now is like the importance of reading, like reading changes you like humans by nature are going to imitate anything around them. And so I'm very, I know, like, I'm very selective on what I let into my brain because I know it's going to influence me, whether it's a TV show, whether it's a, uh, a friendship, whether it's a book. And so I'm not doing all this work to stay the same. Right. And what I'll find is like, if I go back and let's say I re reread, like I just reread um, Henry Ford's autobiography. And from the first time I read, it, I think the first time it was like episode like 25 or something. So since that, the first time I read Henry Ford's autobiography, I've read another, like, let's say 250 biographies, right? So everything I've read up until that point, I've had all these life experiences over the last couple of years informs who I am as a person. So I pick up, the book is the same. I pick up the per the book as a different person. And therefore, like, one of the things I, I, I believe is like, we don't see things as they are. We see things as we are. And so that book and that understanding, now I can have a much deeper understanding because then I'm like, oh, wow. Uh, one example is, is Ford, as, as his uh, business scaled, he was like obsessed with eliminating any kind of waste because, you know, he says like, if I can eliminate, you know, 10 steps from each employee and I got 200,000 employees, like he actually did the math in the book. Like I just eliminated, you know, 25 miles a day or whatever and saved this amount of time every day. And I was like, oh, that's exactly what Rockefeller said, where Rockefeller was like obsessed with like, he sees this person uh, taking the, the, the barrels of oil and saying, hey, we used 40 drops of solder or whatever it's called uh to seal it have you tried 38 and they try 38 and the barrels leak he's like okay try 39 they try 39 and it's like the same as 40 and then he does the math where he's like that saved me 2500 dollars the first year but that business you know kept growing big larger and larger he's like you know by year 10 it was saving me hundreds of thousands of dollars hmm. and you realize oh th this is the the thing that's most fascinating to me it's like i love finding ideas where the people didn't know each other they lived at different points in history they worked in different industries and they arrive at similar conclusions. That's how I know the idea is good. Are there books on founders or otherwise that you think everybody should read? Yeah. And I, I hate to say this because the book is, there's very few copies in print and I keep trying to buy all the ones that are there. And now they're, <laughs> because I won't shut up about this book there now, you know, you used to be able to buy the book for like $15. I just checked yesterday. It's $75. Um, if I could only read one book out of every single book that I've read, and I've read the book, I think three times, I'm planning on reading it every year. It's James Dyson's autobiography. The first one, the second one's good too, but he's like a 70 year old guy. You know, it's completely different where the first one he writes, he's in his forties. He had just gone through 14 years of intense struggle. Um, he doesn't know what's ahead of him. The biz, the business that he has is fantastic, but he's only selling vacuums at the, he has one product in one market and they're still doing like 300 million a year. Um, but you fast forward, he kept let that he didn't interrupt the compounding, kept going. And now, you know, I think he owns 100 percent of a business that it probably value at 20 or 30 billion dollars. But the reason I think that's so interesting is one, it's a short book. You can read it in a weekend. And I think there is something to be said. I just discovered this other author named Paul Johnson. And what Paul Johnson does fantastically is he's written like 10 or 12. I don't even know how many biographies a ton, but they're all like 180, 200 pages. And so it's like an intro. If you want more after that, go find a bigger biography. But I think there should be more of these like that. His Paul Johnson's book on Winston Churchill is fantastic. I think it's 190 pages. It's and I've read, I think, two or three biographies of Churchill. That's the one I'd start with, because then you like do you want more Then you can go deeper. But not everybody wants 700 pages and then like a complete breakdown of what their great grandfather was doing last Tuesday. Like that's just not you know interesting to most people. Um, but James Dyson, you can read in a weekend. He's funny, but it's also, it's like, oh, like there was so many times in his life that it was rational for him to give up. Like he's in pain, he's crying. He's like got two mortgages on his house. Yeah, Like 
there's just so and there's just so many times where it's like, why is this not guy not giving up? And you realize that in every single life story and in our lives, you're going to be presented with opportunities. If you're trying to do something difficult, there's there's going to be many times where the rational thing is to quit and you don't quit because you love what you're doing or you're determined to see it through. And on the other side of that pain and agony is like everything you're going after. And you just imagine like there's so many times when you're rereading that book because you know how the story ends. Like, oh, if he quit here, we don't know who he is. And he doesn't have a $30 billion company or even a billion dollar company or any, he doesn't even have a company. Maybe mm -hmm. he's an engineer in somebody else's company and he's just deeply unhappy because he knew he was destined to be an entrepreneur. He wanted to be a maker of products and he wanted those products to have his name on them. That's a line from the book. And so that's that's a book that is absolutely fantastic. Another one that I, like, I'm shocked at how few founders and entrepreneurs and even investors read is Estee Lauder's autobiography. I think it's called like a success story, really hard book to find. Another one that's probably 40 years old because when she published it, she was still alive and Estee Lauder was a private company. And you could read that book in a weekend too. I think it's like 220, 250 pages and very simple language. And she just lays out the exact same thing. She had a dream. She was obsessed with beauty. She had all these times in life where she had to put the, the wants and desires of other people um, ahead of her own. She got married and at that time in history, you know, very few women were starting companies uh, then she had to raise her, her sons. And then eventually I think she starts a company when she's 40. And the crazy thing is now me and Patrick are actually going to do an episode on Estee Lauder on his show, business breakdowns in a few weeks. And because the crazy thing is he was telling me the other day, I think the, the, that's like a, you know, they're doing tens of billions of dollars in revenue. It's a giant company. And it's like, that started out with one 40 year old lady with a dream on, and the first Estee Lauder product line was at, at a counter in a beauty shop. And then just her relentless obsession with not only does she love her work, but all the advice that she gives to future generations of entrepreneurs is just perfect. And it's like, again, it gets her simple language and the way she tells stories gets it, the, these ideas get in your brain and they stay there. And I just think that's a really good use of a few hours of your time. Those stories sound like they have a lot of dedication and grit. Do, do you have any observations from the research that you've done on the role of luck that that uh, is played for these founders? Yeah, the I think this is what um like Charlie Munger has that saying. It's like you need to master the big ideas in like a handful of subjects like physics and and all these and probability and everything else because he says like they carry the most uh he says they carry the most freight. The line I use after seeing all this is like time carries the most weight, and you just have to stay in the game long enough for luck to be an asset to you, right? Mm -hmm. Where there's no possible way. Like I just reread another, the best biography on Steve Jobs, and I've read like a dozen books on him, to my opinion, is Becoming Steve Jobs, the evolution from a reckless upstart to a visionary leader, I think is the subtitle. And the reason that's important is because 20-year-old Jobs was like building great products, right? The the Apple II was a phenomenal product. You were from like, a, from zero to within four years, they're a public company, all that one product. And so that's fantastic. But like, think about all the other products that he made after the fact, but he had to go again through like 12 years of struggle when he gets kicked out of between when he gets kicked out of Apple and then goes back, which actually is today, the day we're recording this. I just saw somebody tweet that the day he got kicked out and the day he returned, I think happened on the same day, 12 years apart. I didn't know that before. Hmm. I, I hope he's this guy did his research and it's accurate and not giving you bad information. But like there, there's, of course, like the world is complex. Like if you have a good business, time is an ally. So stay in the game as long as possible. So you can get lucky where he had to, there's no way you could. And he says, this is like, you can't, you can't predict things looking forward. You can only connect the dots looking back as a, as a Steve Jobs quote. So it's like all the stuff he learned from building the Apple II. He, his first computer, his first product is a, is a smash. Then his next few, the Lisa flop, the Apple three mm -hmm. flop, the Macintosh, right? Which is beloved now and had a huge marketing push had, good like one year or two years of sales and then fell off a cliff, right? So that was a flop too. Then he goes through 13 years of struggle, winds up accidentally just like discovering Pixar, right? And then that was evolution. There's a Pixar, the, the role that Ed Catmull and John Lasseter, which are the co-founders of Pixar, played in Steve Jobs' life is like can't be under uh, like understated. Then he has to go through that. Then he comes back, starts making better like laptops for uh, and desktops for, for Apple. Then has the ideas, like random ideas, like maybe we should make a music player. Then the iPod, smash hit, right? And then he's like, oh, well, they have the idea actually to do the iPad before the iPhone, right? Yeah. And 
Steve Jobs shelved that. He taught he tells Johnny Ive, he's like, I don't know if I can convince people to buy a new form factor. I know I can convince them to buy a better phone. So let's mm-hmm. put all of our energy into that. Yep. And so my point is like, think about the string of luck and circumstance that he had to go through for 30 years. Starts building products when he's like 18, but his very best product, the iPhone, wasn't made for 35 years in the future. So it plays a huge, like, and what people call luck, I call randomness. It's mm-hmm. just life is full of randomness and complex. And that's why, like, I've had people, uh, I've had a bunch of publishers approach me. And they're like, hey, we want you to write a book and, you know, do your top 10 lessons that you learn. I, was, I refuse. Because that's dumbing down what is an extremely complex, uh, like a, a complex endeavor. Building a company is a comp is building a complex adaptive system, but it's just a microcosm of like the complexity of life. And so you can't say, oh, if you do these ten things, you're going to succeed. No, like you're that part of it is like that's why I'm obsessed with the personality types because they're they're crazy people. They're fundamentally crazy. It's like so much easier to just go get a job, like yeah. you know what I mean. Like go to an already existing. That's why I feel, I feel founders are the most important people in the world. And when I say founders, I do not just mean people that start companies. I mean people that start anything, an idea, a charity, a movement, a religion, a company. It's like you have to be a crazy person to be like, hey, I have this idea in my mind and it has to exist in the world. And I know creating new things and making them exist in the world is an extremely difficult and strenuous and stressful and in many, in many cases, agonizing, inducing experience. And they do it anyway. So yeah, I, again, I think a lot of this is just it's it's how can I figure out to make randomness an asset? That's why I think I like a lot of the writing of Nassim Taleb because that's like his whole thing. And the way I, the it's almost like when I say time carries the most weight, it's almost like a a, a flip on his idea where it's like he has this great book. They're all really good, but uh, called Anti Fragile, and he said something one time that I thought was fantastic. And they're like, "Hey, how would you describe the concept of anti fragility to a five year old?" And he said, time is smarter than you. And that's why I don't like everybody's like, hey, do a do a book on the Uber founders or the WeWork founders. I'm like, no, no, I I like studying dead entrepreneurs because I don't know if somebody's operating today, if they're going to be successful in the future. I use time as my filter. So like I know the ideas that Henry Ford had when building his company were good Mm -hmm. because time proved that. I know Steve Jobs, Rockefeller, all these people like because you allow time to filter through that. I don't know if the, the new way some people are doing things are actually going to work out. That's so interesting. And one of your recommendations on that podcast was uh, the book called Instant, the, the story of Edwin Land, which is an amazing story. You talk about perseverance and luck and vision. It's just unbelievable to read what happened. I didn't know that story at all. Yeah, I didn't either. And books are the original link. I would I didn't know who Edwin Land was until I read it, until Steve Jobs would not shut up about the guy. <laughs> I was right. like, oh, if if, this, if in my opinion, Steve's the greatest entrepreneur ever to it, right? So I was like, if the greatest entrepreneur to ever do it is telling you, hey, this guy's the hero, this should be who we aspire to be, like, then why? I think it'd be like professional malpractice for me not to go and, and chase down every single book that I can find about Edwin Land. Then I'm not doing my job. And then I'm not serious about it. Fascinating. This is really fascinating. Last question for you, David. What advice would you give to someone who does want to read more? That's a hard question for me to answer because it's like no one would have to give me advice on it, how to read more. Just if you want to do if you want to do something, you'll do it. And if you find that you're like I, my favorite maxim of all time is actions express priority. And so like it's like anything else in life. If you really love to do it, you can't you can't wait for somebody else to tell you, oh, you should read more. Or you should exercise more. Or you should be a better father. Like you should just do it. And if you actually love to do it then people, your actions will express that. But there's a lot of people, one of my oldest friends, same thing. He's like, I want to lose weight. He's been trying to lose the same 30 pounds for a decade. You don't actually want to lose weight. You want to sit on your couch, drink whiskey and eat chips. There's nothing wrong with that. But don't (laughs) delude yourself into saying that this is what you want to do because your actions tell other people what you want to do. And so the big, easiest thing is if you want to read more, pick up a book and read more. Great advice. David, this has been fantastic. Thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, of course. Thanks for the invite.